Hi, Jessica. How are you? Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi, Dan. Hi, Lilia. It's great to have everyone here. So this is uh, our latest training in a series of webinars that we've hosted for Give Miami Day. We're really excited for, for this training and for uh, our participating nonprofits to learn more about digital marketing and tips um, to uh, improve their, their campaign for, during Give Miami Day and to raise more dollars thanks to your tips, Dan. Wonderful. And did you want to talk, Jessica, a little bit about the work that Give uh, Miami Foundation is doing in support of educating um, folks around how to uh, use Give Miami Day more effectively and the resource you have on your website where recordings are of past sessions? Sure, of course. So we've hosted uh, many, uh, I think around 10 webinars in the past few weeks. We had one every week uh, since uh, late August, and they are all uh, available on the Give Miami Day website. So givemiamiday.org, you have key dates and trainings, and they are uh, all available there. They're all also available on our YouTube channel. We have a lot of campaign resources on our website, uh, the Give Miami Day website, sorry. It is being updated regularly. So so we will soon have the list of prices and many more resources for, for nonprofits. And as um, it relates to marketing, we had a webinar that we hosted a few weeks ago on general strategies, uh, online strategies uh, that we hosted with Philanthropy Miami. And earlier on, we had a another training focused on Canva. So uh, if nonprofits want to learn more on how to create nice graphics to promote their campaign, we also have this one. It was hosted by Nikki on our team and it's available on YouTube and on the Give Miami Day website. Jessica, make sure that you share all those links uh, in the chat so people can go to the website, to the YouTube channel, and to the past trainings. Sure, I'll share, I'll share them right away. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, you know, BizHack Academy has been a trainer uh, in collaboration with the Miami Foundation for Give Miami Day for uh, four or five years now. And it's a real passion of ours to support nonprofits. Um, we've had a number of nonprofits who've gone through our program, including the Miami Foundation staff itself. Um, and uh, my wife is the CEO of Catalyst Miami. Her name's Gretchen Biesing. Um, and so I live every day uh, with, uh, you know, someone who's working and, 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 and trying to, to push forward uh, a nonprofit mission. And I know uh, really how challenging it can be uh, to market effectively. And so that's really what today is all about. Today is going to be, we're going to be talking specifically uh, about nonprofit marketing. Um, and we're going to use Give Miami Day uh, as essentially a good test case, a good opportunity for you to upgrade your marketing effectively. Um, Jessica, anything else you wanted to mention in terms of any future programming or uh, any other support that Give Miami uh, that the Miami Foundation is offering for Give Miami Day before we launch in? So there's one thing that we announced last week. It's the mission control room that uh, is being um, hosted by Radical Partners and CIC Miami. And I just shared the link in the chat. There's more information. Re uh, nonprofits that have registered to Give Miami Day can register to the mission control. And this will uh, offer nonprofits support all day through Give Miami Day. So this is a great opportunity and resource for nonprofits. And we encourage all the registered nonprofits to register to mission control. And uh, I'm sorry, and you might have, I might have missed this. Tell me again exactly what mission control is, just so that uh, everybody's clear on that. It sounds like a very powerful resource. Sure. So mission control is something that has been hosted for five years uh, by Radical Partners, and it is uh, just support. And Radical Partners, for those of you who don't know, is the organization founded by the current head of the Miami Foundation. Yes. Yes, exactly. Um, and so, and is also uh, headed by Joanne Godoy, who, uh, sorry, is from Philanthropy Miami and hosted the webinar with us a few weeks ago. So they are going to uh, be 
uh, offering support and resources to nonprofits all day through Give Miami Day. It will be virtual this year, um, but nonprofits that are registered will have access to a lot of tools and resources and fun activities throughout the day to boost their campaign, to be supported, energized, and to feel like they're part of a community also. They can interact uh, with each other. So a lot of uh, details are on our website about this. Um, and so we encourage all registered nonprofits to learn more, register and um, Sorry, I see that there is a question. So every well, you can learn more. I shared the link, givemiamiday.org slash mission control, where you can learn more about what this day, what this is going to look like for nonprofits and CIC and CIC Miami and Radical Partners involvement and how they are going to lead this effort for our nonprofits on that day. Everything is on the website. Wonderful. And that website is in the chat, everybody. Um, the chat's really important. And I'd like you all to go into the chat right now and just take a minute and introduce yourself. Tell us what the name of your, uh, what's your name, your nonprofit's name. And then uh, tell, tell me what your biggest marketing challenge is. I'd really like to make this, you know, as useful as possible to all of you. Uh, and the best way for me to do that is if you could tell me what is your biggest challenge. We're going to be going through uh, five tools, uh, five insights that you guys can use for your nonprofit. Uh, but I do want you to know that we have time for Q&A. And we're going to start with the questions that are in uh, the Q&A box. Um, so if you could uh, put your name and introduction uh, and your biggest marketing challenge uh, into the chat. And then as any questions come up, um, you know, I'm going to be sharing some relatively advanced stuff today. Uh, feel free to throw a question. Uh, Lilia is going to be um, uh, monitoring that. And uh, the other thing is, um, you know, it's kind of a give back to the nonprofit community. Um, you know, I'm making myself available over the next couple of weeks to meet one on one with you guys. Um, and Lilia is going to be reaching out to you individually. Lilia, by the way, is the, my partner here at, uh, from BizHack. She's going to be reaching out individually with each of you if you did want to um, schedule some time with me uh, over the next couple of weeks to talk about your Give Miami Day campaign. Uh, really would love to, to meet with you guys. Um, we've worked with uh, Philanthropy Miami, the Miami Foundation, as we discussed. So we really, um, I'm very expert in nonprofit marketing. I spent um, most of my career, uh, as I'll talk about shortly, in the nonprofit space. So this is really um, a pet project of mine. It's part of our give back. Um, we were part of the nonprofit academy from Daniela Levine Cava in District 8. We've been a trainer in Philanthropy Miami. We've trained dozens of nonprofits. Uh, we know, we know how hard it is for you right now, um, especially with COVID. And we're here, I'm here, and dedicated to helping you guys. We've also done trainings for the Radical Partners um, cohorts. So like, just think of us as a, as a resource and, and a support. Because uh, we know it's really hard to market. Uh, you guys face limited budgets, a ton of demands. Uh, oftentimes, marketing and um, and um, development kind of are, are, are merged together uh, when they really should be think thought of as separate. Sometimes PR and communications is merged with marketing. They really should be separated. There, there is a role and a place for marketing, and it's one of the most consistently uh, underinvested parts of nonprofits. And so. You know, bless you guys for being here today. Bless you for being a nonprofit marketer. And boy, you have your challenge cut out for you. So today uh, we're going to share with you um, some, uh, you know, simple uh, tools uh, and free, um, you know, resources that you can use uh, to help your nonprofit. And, and we're, we're making a case today uh, for advertising online. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you about why we frame this education in that way uh, here in a second. So today we're going to be looking at Audience Insights, a free tool for audience discovery, lookalike audiences, uh, a very powerful way to grow your, uh, your base. Retargeting, uh, which is a technical term for getting folks who've engaged with you uh, online uh, to uh, take that next step in their journey. Uh, we're going to talk about email. 
uh, the single most profitable and easy to use of all marketing channels. Uh, and then finally, uh, Google for Nonprofits, an incredible resource from Google. Uh, they really do good work helping and supporting nonprofits and too few nonprofits take advantage of it. So today we're here to talk about the five reasons your nonprofit should start advertising online today. Um, a few of you, not many, uh, have introduced yourselves in the chat. I would invite you to introduce yourselves, uh, more of you to introduce yourselves in there. Um, thank you, uh, Janina. Thank you, Erman. Thank you, Trillian. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Paola. Uh, thank you, Andy, um, Laverne, uh, Isela, uh, Anna, Gwendolyn. I see all of you, Adriana, uh, Rosie, um, Amanda, Ivy, uh, Fahawam, uh, Pascal. Uh, great, is to, great to have you here. Um, just looking at some of the challenges that you guys have um, is reaching enough donors to meet your goals for Give Miami Day. Amen, right? Everybody feels that one. Um, I'm just looking for every, any others. Um, I see another one is donor reach is a challenge. Um, uh, Brianna said her biggest challenge is expanding into different communities to build mission awareness. So Brianna is basically saying, um, look, our impact is gonna be measured by how many people are aware of the work we do in part. And right now, not enough people are aware of the work we do. Uh, amen, Brianna, that's marketing. And unfortunately, too few uh, nonprofits engage in marketing, uh, engage in getting noisy about the work they do. And, and this is a huge problem, honestly. This is a, uh, a, 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 your impact is less than it would be if more people knew about your work because the more people know about your work the more people who will want to donate who will want to volunteer who will want to participate in your programs uh unfortunately most nonprofits, in my experience um are really kind of catering to a bubble of people and they really struggle to break out of the bubble um you can see here that i used to work at npr miami we used to call this the 10 percent 10 percent of people love NPR, donate to NPR, listen religiously to NPR, are raving fans of NPR, and 90% have never heard of us. We called it the 10%. And we were obviously really proud that we had raving fans in the 10%, but we were limited in our reach by the fact that 90% of us had never heard of us. That's what marketing is about. It's breaking out of that bubble, and that's what we're here to talk about. There are really clear tools that very few of you are using to help you break out of the bubble. Uh, Jessica, does that make sense, uh, what I'm saying? Good. All right, so my background, as I said, is a journalist of 15 years. I, I really think of myself as a business storyteller. Uh, and I started out at the Washington Post, the Miami uh, Herald, the Boston Globe. I was part of a Pulitzer Prize and uh, participated in contributions to a book, had an amazing run as a print journalist, and then I switched over to radio, spent a decade in broadcast for NPR and PBS, was a foreign correspondent in Argentina uh, covering Latin America, and then finally uh, became news director for several years of NPR Miami, and uh, loved that work, got a master's degree at FIU in storytelling, and then transitioned about a decade ago into business storytelling, uh, also known as marketing. And now uh, I, for four years, I've been an educator um, a, and a business owner of BizHack, which is dedicated to making it easier for you to grow your nonprofit and to grow your business. And um, we've been recognized by a number of accelerators. We were a top startup in 2019 in the Startup Challenge by the Miami Herald. The Knight Foundation funded us uh, for their accelerator program, SWAT 305. And importantly, we partnered with the top educators uh, around South Florida, three of the top 10 largest university, uh, largest colleges in the country, Broward College, FIU, and the Idea Center at Miami-Dade College. Uh, we also have a really proven track record of helping uh, minority-owned businesses, uh, women-owned businesses, um, and small businesses generally. Um, and we also have uh, a scholarship program that I'm gonna be talking about at the end that incorporates nonprofits as well. So we're very proud of our community partnerships and the work we do uh, on behalf of nonprofits, women-owned and minority-owned businesses. Women-owned businesses represent 70% of our clients, 87% of our clients are minority-owned. We're actually a participant in the Black 
Empowerment Month programming. Uh, we really believe very strongly that small businesses and underrepresented businesses uh, need a leg up, and that's what we're here to do. So you guys have a huge marketing challenge. Number one, the user of your service is not always the payer for that service. Let me explain. A donor for Give Miami Day might be somebody who actually utilizes the services that you provide. You know, a good example is a museum or a theater. You know, the patrons who go to the theater, who go to the museum, they actually donate to it as well. So they pay tickets and they watch theater or they look at art shows, but they also donate to it. That's where the user and the payer are the same. But most nonprofits don't work like that. Catalyst Miami, for instance, serves low-income communities. Some of them do donate, but they're very small amounts of money. They donate what they can, 10, 15, 20 dollars. You know, Give Miami Day is built with minimum donations of $25 for the higher donor value. And that usually is not the service uh, receiver uh, for most nonprofits. So most like social justice nonprofits are really looking to raise money from a different audience. And that's a huge challenge. No other business works like this. Funding and using are the same people in most businesses. Good example, you buy an iPad, you use the iPad. You're the beneficiary of the purchase. It's so much easier to market when you have one audience. You guys have to market to two. And the, and the good that you're selling when you're a donor is like psychological, which is a really complex thing to sell. Like I'm selling making you feel good about yourself, right? That's what donation is about or being part of a community of donors. That's what donation is about. It's a different thing entirely than selling a widget. And so your marketing challenge is massive, it's huge. And I understand it really well because for 15 years, I worked at a company that gave, a nonprofit that gave away its product for free over the airwaves, NPR, and then we had to convince people to become members. So we really sold the notion of community and that's how we sold and it was a hard sell. It was a hard sell. Second, in every organization I have seen, with the very few exceptions of the big guys, like the Arsht Center and the big Perez Museums, Pam, like you guys are all underfunded with marketing. It's like a part-time role. You don't have enough resources. Your, your CEO or executive director doesn't really understand it. You're always getting pulled into like event creation or uh, donor cultivation or uh, PR, um, areas that are... Um, adjacent to, but are not actually the core of marketing, especially digital marketing. And so therefore you, you tend to be underfunded and very few grant givers will give you the money to actually market. In other words, they'll give you plenty of money to run the program, but they won't give you any money unless you really ask for it and insist on it to market the program. And this is a huge gap in the way that nonprofit programs are funded. And uh, it's often folded into overhead and overhead is really hard to get money behind. And so therefore marketing is always imperiled. It's the first thing that goes when funds get tight because it is not grant guaranteed. And number one, and this isn't really what today is about. This is much more tactical, but number one, nonprofits have to start asking for marketing funding in their core budgets as a separate carve out and a dedicated funding source. Because if you don't, you will never marketing will always be a part-time side activity. It needs to become a core part of program delivery. So that's the challenge, that's the bad news. The good news is y'all are smart. And so you guys are smart cookies. We're gonna give you some, some tricks and tips that will allow you to be smarter to win because you don't have the money, you don't have the resources and you have a bigger marketing challenge. So I wanna just go through quickly your objections. The number one is I always hear people say, I'm sorry, we cannot advertise online because we don't have the money. Well, number one, marketing online is way cheaper than you might think, especially if you use platform like Facebook or Instagram. You know, in our courses, we recommend budgets of 100 to $150, and that's enough for our seven-week program to put out test and learn ad campaigns, two to three for that budget. So do you guys have $150 to run some test and learn campaigns on Facebook or Instagram? If the answer is no, that's fine. Uh, the, 
most nonprofits can find that money. It's really just about making sure that those those campaigns uh, are are well designed and that they um, and that they're very specific to trying to learn new things about your target audience. The other thing is most people who aren't marketers think about marketing in terms of spending money. It's a cost center, but we think of marketing and advertising as a revenue generator, as a way to drive donations. For every dollar you spend, you should get five dollars in donations. So we actually like to think of it as a, an activity that can have money grow on trees. That if you put a little bit of marketing budget behind your marketing efforts, you can actually have a positive return on investment. You can get more donors dollars than money spent. And so to frame it not as a don uh, as a cost center, but as a investment in faster growth and larger donations. And then finally. Very few nonprofits, unfortunately, do what's known as segmentation. And segmentation is just fancy marketing speak for saying targeting narrow niches of audiences, sub segments of your possible your world of possible donors, and giving very targeted messages to that sub segment to that niche. Um, you should be doing this with your email. Um, we'll talk about email in a sec, but. The more targeted you are in general with your digital communications, the more effective it will be. And advertising is incredibly targeted. And we're going to find out some of the really cool different types of targeting you can do with online advertising. So I want to start by giving you what I hope is a very simple, uh, accessible example of one nonprofit that used very small budget digital marketing to have a very transformative impact on their, um, their nonprofit. So this is a pre-COVID example, I should warn you, but it does show you the power of digital marketing. And I love the example because it's really vivid. Um, so Moon River Cabaret um, was a cabaret show, a burlesque show. It was a, you know, basically a tasteful strip show, if you will. And they were the first and only cabaret in all of South Florida. Um, and they kicked off in, De December, uh, January of 2019, and they were doing it at Barter Wynwood, um, uh, which is a great little venue. And they had two or three shows lined up, and and they told their whole friends and family network come to our shows, and they filled up the shows. But they were trying to make this into like a monthly thing, and when the March or April show came around, they noticed the ticket sales were going down. You you can only sell to your friends and family so much. You have to start selling to strangers if you're gonna be an ongoing theater concern. And Barter Winwood had said, look, we will give you a permanent home for this show once a month if you can prove over the course of six months that you can fill the place. So they, had, they were under pressure. They knew that they weren't gonna fill up for their, uh, for their third or fourth show unless they did a different tactic than just promoting to their existing network. So what did they do? They tried to put uh, some posts on Facebook and then maybe would boost them. And that didn't work. Uh, they had no sellouts. Nobody seemed to react. It seemed like the only people even seeing their Facebook posts were people who already knew them and liked them. So it wasn't really serving any purpose. What did they do? They decided a different tactic. They went through one of our training programs and they decided to run a video ad on Facebook. They spent $20 on this. The video that they built was a video uh, with a slideshow of photos. One thing that burlesque shows have a lot of are great photos. So they just created a quick slideshow. It took them less than an hour. They spent 20 bucks on the ad total. They ran it six days prior to the show. So they did it last minute and their goal was to get 10 second video views and it'll get the person to watch for 10 seconds uh, this video slideshow they created. What was key was that niche audience that they used. Their target audience was veterans and lookalikes. And we're gonna talk about lookalikes a little later, but they used Facebook audience insights and they found that military veterans were big fans of burlesque because of their time overseas. They used to consume burlesque, a lot of Vietnam vets and so forth. They also wanted to target the friends of the cabaret, but not uh, the friends of the friends of the cabaret, not their friends, not their existing audience, the friends of those people. And you can do that 
with something called lookalikes. Um, they also realized that people who like dinner theater, pinup stars, th people that are transgender friendly, people who are in, into off off Broadway, all of these interest categories, which you can find on Facebook, were part of their targeting. And then they limited it to the 25 miles uh, around their venue. Um, this was the actual results of their campaign. It cost seven cents to get someone to watch the video. And then 32 people clicked through to the ticketing site. So for every click on the ticketing site, all they had to pay was $63. Um, so that's what this would look like. Uh, 2,000 people reached, 270 people watched the video. And uh, I'm sorry that the, the image is a little unclear, uh, but they had um, 32 clicks. So what happened as a result? Their first ever sellout. The ad led to several more pre-sales, but more importantly, it raised a ton of awareness and they had a, a rush of door sales. In other words, the ad not only led some people to actually transact, but it also led a lot more people to mark their calendar and just show up and buy at the door. Now, how did they know that those people were from the Facebook ad? Because the only difference between what they had done before and what they did for this one was the Facebook ad. And when they asked people, oh yeah, we saw your post on Facebook. They didn't even realize it was an ad. Uh, I marked my calendar and then we just decided to come out and see if we couldn't buy a ticket. Well, they ended up selling out the show, 90 new, 92 new people with a $20 ad spend showed up. That is a $900 return on investment and a 4,500% uh, return on their ad spend. This, this is why with tiny budgets, uh, a very specific and differentiated offering to a very clear target audience can have just extraordinary results. And this was, this completely changed the course of the cabaret. They got their permanent home. Uh, obviously COVID disrupted that, but they were able to use this to help get Barter to believe, yes, you guys can consistently bring an audience. And what's so good about advertising is whenever you need to reach new strangers, you run another ad. It's really a way to break through that bubble we talked about. So let's get to the five reasons. Um, the first one is audience insight. So Facebook is an incredible tool for you guys. As you saw, you can use it for very low cost targeted advertising. Facebook is by far the cheapest of all the advertising platforms. It's also uh, not easy to learn, but easier to learn than Google uh, and some of the others. Google in particular, I like to say, is built by Google engineers for Google engineers. Facebook has a more intuitive, user-friendly uh, design and with a little bit of help uh, or some tutorials online that you can get for free from Facebook's free ad academy, they call it Blueprint, uh, you can get learnings from there. Now, why Facebook? It has pretty much everybody in the world is on it. 80% of people in the United States that are online are on Facebook or Instagram or WhatsApp. So a lot of people are like, because remember, Facebook owns Instagram and WhatsApp. A lot of people are like, ah, Facebook, they're evil, they're bad, you know, whistleblower, they're bad for preteens, I don't like them. Mark Zuckerberg's just a rich jerk. I'm going to be on Instagram instead. Or... Instagram is owned by Facebook. I hate them too. I'm going to talk, I'm going to tell my friends how much I hate them on WhatsApp. Well, WhatsApp is owned by Facebook too. They're, they're unavoidable. Um, they are a tool. They're a reality of life. Your audience is there. You should use the tool to grow your nonprofit. So what is an ad? Remember I mentioned a lot of people don't know the difference between an ad and a, a post. And by the way, an ad is different than a boost. An ad says sponsored. So if you like go into your Facebook feed right now, pick up your phone and look, you will see every fifth post is sponsored. And a sponsored post, right, is something someone paid for to get to your eyeballs. And if you are a nonprofit, in other words, if you have a company page as you're required to as a nonprofit, the only way to reach audiences uh, that aren't in your network are ads. And by the way, you only reach people inside your network uh, at less than 5% per post. So in other words, if you have 100 followers and you post organically, you just put a post on your feed, only five of the 100 will, will likely see it and often fewer than that. So if you notice that you post and there's no activity at all, 
It's not because Facebook doesn't work. It's because Facebook isn't showing it to anyone. So what do you do? You boost it. And by boosting, you're just paying for what you used to get for free. Boosting doesn't work. Facebook ads are a much better investment of, the of your money. They take a little more time to create, but they don't actually cost more as we saw. So Facebook Audience Insights is a free tool that helps you learn about your audience. In order to use it, you do need to have a Business Manager account set up. The way to do that is go to business.facebook.com and then you'll see Insights is one of the tabs. Um, what makes Insights really powerful uh, is that it allows you to put in uh, criteria about the audience and then you can learn more uh, about them. So uh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for one second. Um, I'm gonna open it up to questions. I see that there's a question right now um, from uh, Julia. Do you have any information on how to research price points for events that work well to figure out how to price an event or donation for a specific demographic? Is it better to have a price or suggested donation or a donation? I have no idea. <laughs> so uh, Jessica, uh, is that a question you might know an answer to, or is there somebody who's attending, if you look at the attendees list, that might be able to answer that question? I, I, I don't really know the answer. Is there anybody in the group here? We have brilliant people in the group. Uh, look at that question from Julia. Raise your hand if you know an answer to that. Um, and while she's doing that, I'm going to set up a quick demo uh, for us. Um, Lily, please monitor and let me know if you see anybody raise their hand for that. Okay. Okay. All right. So I'm going to share my screen now. This is a bit of a live demo. Live demos are always risky because they often don't work. So please uh, bear with me, guys. So this is business.facebook.com. This is the business manager. You can notice it's inviting me to log in. If you're here for the first time, you would, they would invite you to create an account. So I'll hit log in. And, you know, uh, I hope this works. Okay. So this is Facebook Business Suite. This is your passport uh, to unlocking the potential uh, of Facebook um, advertising. And it's a, it's a lot. It's a lot to take in. For those of you who've never seen it before, it's a little bit overwhelming, even though it is simpler uh, than what else is out there uh, from Google. Um, but what you can do is you can create ads, you can build audiences, you can use the insights tool that I mentioned. So I'm gonna show you kind of how uh, the audiences work and can get built um, in this quick demo. So, uh, so far, all I did is I logged in and I clicked on audiences and it gives me an option to create a couple of different audiences, a custom audience, which is an audience of people that have engaged with you. So if they've connected with you on Facebook, connected with you on uh, Instagram, uh, interacted with one of your posts or pages, you can interact with them. These are the different lists of activities that you can uh, do. So if they interacted with your website and you have the pixel installed, uh, and if you don't know what I mean by the pixel installed, that's a good thing to Google for after this session, you can do it this way. Um, if they interacted with your app, if they're on a customer list, an email list that you have, you can upload that. Um, if they've interacted with a Facebook video or Instagram video, filled out a lead form, uh, interacted with your Instagram account, gone to one of your events, interacted with your Facebook page, all of those are ways to create audiences. So I'll give you an example. Let's say I want to get the people who viewed at least three seconds of my video. And then you can choose from any of the, these videos uh, that I have. Um, so I say, okay, anybody who's looked at any of these videos, I want to write, do an ad to them. And that's what this allows you to do. Pretty cool. Um, you can also say, hey, anybody who's interacted with my Instagram account, right? Um, so here's my BizHack Academy, anyone who's engaged with it, anyone who's visited it, anyone who engaged with the post or ad. There, there's no other way to do this, to reach people who've engaged with you than paying for it. So you can see, I hope, 
just the breathtaking power of creating audiences using this. Now, if you don't uh, have that available, you can then use what's called a saved audience. And that's when you start doing targeting around interests. So you might remember from this case study, oops, wrong thing. From this case study, some of the interests they targeted were folks who liked live theater, including off off Broadway. So I'm like, okay, uh, let's target Let's see if this comes up. There it is, off, off Broadway. So that is actually a targeting criteria. Let's do pinups. So pinup girl, lost pinup. Notice that sometimes it's spelled like this. So anybody who's got interest in pinup girls or pinups, so pinup curvy and rocker pinups. All these are now interests that you can target. And let's say we want to focus on men. Uh, we want an older demographic, right? So let's say 35 to 55. Uh, and we want them to be uh, near. So um, let's have them be near uh, Wynwood, Florida. Let's see if that's listed as a possibility. So barters in Wynwood. We want anybody uh, who's in the Wynwood area, who've, uh, who are living in or recently in this location, all right? That's the power of Facebook. And this is a audience that you can now uh, target with your ad. This is why I strongly recommend Facebook for nonprofits because you can get really specific. And frankly, the ads, as I showed you, are not that expensive. So let's move on to the next one. Um, look-alike audiences. So as I showed you there, there, you have the core audience, which is an audience you build by hand or also known as a saved audience. You have the custom audience, which is when you upload a customer list or, or get people who interacted with you uh, on Instagram. Then there's this third group, which is your friends of your friends, and it's called a look-alike audience. So going back in here, did you see that there is this third version? This lookalike audience version is reach new people who are similar to audiences that you care about. So the very best example of a lookalike audience for Give Miami Day for a nonprofit is the lookalike of donors, past donors. So get your list of donors, upload them as a custom audience, and then create a lookalike audience of that. And what they'll give you is people who are similar to your past donors, not the same people, similar to those people. So I just clicked on look alike. Pretend uh, for a second that you click other sources and let's just pretend for a sec that your my alumni list is your past donor list, right? And then uh, you're gonna search, uh, I wouldn't worry about searching for a location yet, and then you select a number between one and 10. A 1% means they're very similar. A 10% means they're sort of similar. And you can pick any number in between. Um, if your geography is limited, I definitely would recommend you keep the number in the four, five, six or above. If your geography is very uh, large, in other words, you can donate, get donations from uh, anywhere in the nation, then you can be a little bit more targeted. Um, you know, BizHack, which sells nationally and internationally, we tend to keep in the one, two, three percent range. This represents one, two, or three percent of the U.S. population. So, one percent of 250 million is 25,000 people, right? 10 percent is 2.5 million people. Did I do that right? 250? No, uh, one percent is 2.5 million. 10% is 25 million. So you can see that these numbers are huge, right? This is the, the 25 million people, uh, the 2.5 million people in the United States that are most like 
my alumni. This is the 25 million people who are most like. So it's really the, the similar to or the look like is still a huge audience. And then you have to continue to uh, add additional targeting criteria to then limit it. This is some technical stuff. So I wanna make sure that I'm addressing any questions uh, that might have been asked. Um, how do we upload the list of past donors to Facebook by Paola? I'll show you in a second. And then if you upload the uh, uh, users, uh, does Facebook have total access to them for any other reason? No, there's a technology that they use called hashing, H-A-S-H, -H, which makes it so that Facebook does not have access to them for any reason. It is a crypto, uh, cryptography standard so they genuinely don't have access to that data, but they are still able to match uh, your people to their uh, profiles. Um, and I'll show you how you upload in a sec. And then, yeah, so Facebook is not allowed, Amy, uh, to use that for any other purposes. So you go here, you go to custom audience, you click on customer list. This is all being recorded uh, and it'll be shared uh, on the BizHack YouTube channel and on the a resource page on the Miami Foundation as well. And then what you do is you uh, upload, you prepare a customer list, uh, donor list. You can either import it from MailChimp, you can uh, download the file template and then upload the file with the names. Uh, and then they have this link that gives you uh, instructions on formatting. Thanks for your great questions, guys. It really helps me to know where you're uh, getting stuck. Please use the Q&A uh for this then so number three alexander joseph uh raising his hand i don't know if he's right. gonna help us answer the first question or if he has another yeah question. go ahead this is a perfect time for it do you wanna hey alexander how are you please unmute yourself hi can you hear me alexander Uh, we can't hear you, Alexander. All right, let's continue. Um, we're now going to talk to you about how to turn supporters into donors. And that's really where the custom audiences can become really, really helpful. So while we were talking earlier uh, about how to build audiences from scratch and how to get to access to the friends of friends, one of the best things that you can do is to take your custom audience the people who are already engaging with you via email, on your social media, on your website, and to turn them from a one-time to a sustaining donor. So as we talked about, these are some of the different types of custom audiences that you can build. And we strongly recommend you use uploading your email and phone list. Um, and another approach is also if people visit your website, or visited your Instagram, you can uh, retarget them. And this term retargeting is just fancy pantsy marketing speak for targeting folks who, uh, with an ad who've already interacted with you online. That's really all that means. So uh, what Facebook calls a custom audience is just a form of retargeting. Retargeting is a term that they use all the time in digital marketing. I think it's a terrible term, it's super confusing, but that's what it means. So if you do want to target people who visited your website and you have something called a pixel installed, you're able to do that. So I'll show you how that works. So bizhack.com has a pixel installed. Um, and how do I know that? Uh, because I have this little plugin called Facebook Pixel Helper, and it showed that this pixel has been installed. What that means is every time somebody visits my website, Facebook knows about it. And then I can go into Facebook and I can actually target folks who've been on my website. There's my pixel. I don't know why it's not showing, but it's there. So you can see uh, 14652. 14652. So my website is passing information over to Facebook and then I can target people who visited my website. I hope you guys can immediately see why this is super valuable to you because what happens? Somebody goes to your website 
and they're all psyched and they love you and they want to give you money. And so they click donate, right? And they go to your donate center and they're like, oh, should I become a one monthly contributor or a one-time contribution? You know, honey, what do you think we should do? And they get distracted and they walk away and they leave this page and they never come back, right? And then uh, this is called the um, abandoned shopping cart problem. And it's a really common problem for nonprofits. And it's very profitable for you guys to advertise for people who visited this page, but haven't actually transacted with you. So what you do is you can actually put the website that they visited, people who visited a specific web page. The URL contains this. And now you can actually retarget people who visited your donation page specifically over uh, the last, you know, 90 days. Um, so there's, um, you know, or how many, you can even have people who visited the site more than twice, more than once. It's a really powerful uh, tool that you all should be using. Um, any other questions before we move on to email? So are there any legal privacy ramifications for doing these things? So this is about PII, privately ident personal identifiable information. And Paola, the answer is that this does uh, pass muster for privacy standards for most um, privacy policies that you have on your website. And if your website doesn't have a privacy policy, it should. That's considered a basic best practice for all uh, websites. So every website should have a contract with its, uh, with its um, audience, with, its, with people who visit it, about how they'll use data that they collect on your website. And here is BizHack's privacy policy. And there's a great website called freeprivacypolicy.com uh, where you can actually get uh, a, um, a privacy policy. Some of them are not free, I'll warn you, uh, in order to be able to do this. Uh, and basically, this is a contract with your, um, you know, your users. And so you need to make sure that this contract uh, is accurate to how you plan to use it. And you can see it's not a short one. Uh, but as long as you have this, uh, Facebook will permit you to retarget website visitors and you will be within the current laws uh, that allow you to do it. Um, and you can see it talks about how we use the information, how we share the information, and some of the choices people have to, to, um, uh, to you know, uh, unsubscribe, if you will. So let's talk about email. Email is like all this fancy pantsy Facebook advertising marketing stuff is great, but really the goal of all of it is to just get someone to give you their email address. The question is, what do you do next? And there's a great resource that I highly recommend to all of you, which is Next After. They're a research organization that tests digital marketing strategies for giving. Um, here is Next After. I think, I think that's right. Here, let's just do this. Nonprofit fundraising, optimizing your online fundraising. It is an incredible resource, nextafter.com. We help nonprofits grow their digital fundraising. All of you guys should be leveraging this. And I'm gonna share with you a couple quick, quick insights about email that I've found really helpful. One thing is that we're finding that because of a lot of the spam filters, those heavily designed templates aren't working as well anymore. People really just want personalized emails. The good news is they're easier to write than this fancy template. When they went from a template to just a simple email, they saw a 20% increase in the number of clicks. Personalization is essential. This is basically, um, so Next After did a bunch of studies of email and these were the best practices they found. Um, if just putting hi Jeff uh, versus not having your name at the front will actually lead to a three time increase uh, in clicks. Um, using original language instead of join the fight, 
uh, you can help restore economic freedom. Be more specific uh, about what the value you're, expand, uh, you're, you're proposing to help. That can more than double your conversion rates. Um, all of this basically says, write emails like a human being, right? Would you say, hello, friend, if you're talking to a, a person you know? No. Would you put, um, you know, join the fight? Uh, or would you say, hey, I could really use your help. We're fighting for, you know, women's economic health, right? The more specific language. Um, having it be personal, um, asking for a single thing, a single call to action. All of these things combined will lead to a doubling or more, according to their statistics, of your conversion rates on your emails. And then finally, I wanted to share with you guys a resource that too few of you are using. Now, I will say as a caveat that it does require staff time in order to make take full advantage of these resources. But I think it's if like if I were running a nonprofit, I would use every single piece of this that I could. I would dedicate a staff. I would fund it because Google gives away a ton of money. They have this amazing website, google.com slash nonprofits. And on this is basically access to all of this amazing free and low cost stuff. And one of the things they do is they help you by giving you free advertising dollars, that's what a grant is, to reach more donors online. And you can click here to learn more. And this will now tell you all about the Google ad grants. I, again, as I will say, they require you to manage the account. They can't let you just have the money and put it on autopilot. So you have to log in a certain number of times. You have to use it effectively. It's not easy to launch. I've run trainings just on how to use this. Uh, it does take a little bit of effort, but I think the effort is worth it because this is free advertising dollars to help raise awareness uh, of the program that you're running and ultimately reach more donors and raise more money. So uh, that is it in terms of the formal presentation. Um, I did wanna quickly say before we open it up for Q&A that BizHack does offer scholarships uh, for nonprofits uh, our next course starts on Monday. If you guys are interested in learning more, just uh, apply now. Go to bizhack.com slash apply dash now. Uh, that'll allow you to actually uh, fill out a scholarship application um, and uh, would be happy uh, to evaluate whether you guys are a good fit you know, for the program. Um, it talks a little bit. It's a really simple form. Doesn't take much time at all. And then at the bottom, you just click yes, if you want to apply for a scholarship. Um, this is a course in digital marketing. Uh, it's a mix of nonprofits and mostly for-profit businesses. Uh, this is the course, for instance, that the Miami Foundation and uh, folks from the Knight Foundation and others have taken and had great success. Again, if you want uh, to be a part of our, our scholarship uh, or eligible to apply for our scholarship program, um, it's also open to women and uh, women owned and minority owned businesses and professionals of color. So if you know of anyone else, if you're not yourself uh, interested who uh, fits in any of these categories, uh, I would definitely encourage them to apply. And I just wanted to share this one parting thought. We know that COVID has been difficult um, for nonprofits, especially. And when the word crisis is written in Chinese, it's composed of two characters, danger and opportunity. The danger to all of you and to the people you serve is very clear. People are dying, businesses are going out of businesses, nonprofits are shutting their doors, but there is opportunity as well in all of this. And the opportunity is to try new things, to reach people in new ways, to go and apply for that Google ad grant that you haven't applied for before, to do things differently than the way you've done them before. Because we know that in this world, the old ways aren't gonna work anymore. And so with that, I just wanna say, grasp the opportunity. Don't think in terms of what's not working or what's more difficult. And I invite you guys to grasp the opportunity. We need you in this world. We need more nonprofits doing your amazing work. Thank you so much. Miami Foundation for the opportunity to present to this amazing group. And I'm here to answer any questions you might have. So I'm looking here in the Q&A. 
there's a question from Paula about what about uploading uh, a list of previous donors. As I've mentioned, yes, you may upload previous donors, current donors, even prospective donors. Any list of uh, current or prospective customers can be uploaded uh, using that. Are there any other questions uh, in the chat, Lilia or Jessica? Anything, Jessica, you want me to cover before we wrap up? I'm trying to think. Nothing that I can think of. I think it was very comprehensive and exhaustive, uh, very interesting. Also, I'm sure the nonprofits learned a lot and um, will be able to improve their, their campaign. Thanks to you, Dan. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, as I said, you know, it is a special passion of mine to support and help nonprofits. Uh, and so I'm here to help you guys um, with your marketing, with your Give Miami Day challenges. And so uh, the, please go ahead and use the link uh, that Lilia put into the chat, uh, the uh, BizHack, uh, the Calendly link, and schedule 15 minutes with me. And I promise to help you however best I can. Um, and then Lilia, could you just talk quickly about the thank you gifts that we're gonna be sending folks as a thank you for coming today? Sure, so uh, we want to honor your time and your commitment to come to this session today live. So we're gonna send you a link to the recording. Uh, we're also gonna send you, um, or we can send the, the ebook or some other resources for you to have handy. Um, and yeah, any other handouts or resources from this session, we will be sending that later today to your email. If you don't receive that eh, by the end of the day, please let me know. I'm going to put my email in the chat and I can send you that separate. Okay. Um, Jessica, any final words before we wrap up? Um, nothing except that we are very excited. Give Miami Days in less than a month, and we have more than 900 nonprofits registered this year. So we're really excited for our 10th anniversary and to celebrate together in, in a few weeks. Wonderful. We're so happy to be here in support of you guys. Thank you again for your time, your interest. I see a lot of friendly faces and people I know, uh, including uh, some folks from Catalyst. Thank you guys for coming. And uh, I really wish you all uh, the very best, a very good Give Miami Day, and keep going and doing the good in your world, uh, in the world that you are. Um, you know, one of our core values is grow with purpose. And there are no more purpose-driven organizations and nonprofits. We're here to serve you. So thanks, everybody. We really appreciate you. And Jessica, we'll be getting you a recording of this so that it can be put on your website uh, and, and spread to your, uh, as a continuing resource to your nonprofit partners.